We built Codesmith uh, for these sort of events that we had here with, with Luis to enable people to think bigger than just the particular technology, whether it's Vue or React or Node, but to think as engineers. Luis, uh, data scientist at Glossier, is an expert in this kind of trajectory, having come from Harvard, where he worked in political theory and policy, but with that data science angle. And he gave an outstanding talk that we're very grateful to have here as part of the Codesmith community on the impact that you can make as a data scientist in building products. And bringing that angle to bear on product development, not just the software engineering angle, but also that data angle was, I think, very impactful and a great insight for the Codesmith students to think about as they put together their career paths. So my, my name is Luis Capello, I create data science products, and I, I'm here to tell you why they're cool and, uh, and interesting for businesses and uh, what they are. So uh, as uh, Will said, now I work at Glossier. Who, who knows what Glossier is? Very nice. I'm very happy that you know. I'm very happy to work at a company in which half of the technology team is women. And that's very, very cool. It's very rare. It's the first team that, that I, I have worked that this is the case. And it's, it's really good. So diversity is not just, I think, uh, you know, something that we should aspire to. It, it really makes uh, a, a products all better. So, you know, keep, keep this uh, in mind when you look for a job or uh, when you're uh, in your career. Okay, so uh, previously worked at Forbes and I, I've, I've written two books uh, about, you know, how to write programs uh, using TensorFlow. Nothing very special there. There are a lot better books, so don't buy my books. Um, uh, and I do contribute to open source software. I love boxing. Um, it's a very cool thing to do. Okay, now uh, this talks about the design and development of uh, data science products. Now, data science products are things that you're familiar with. You know, you know what they are. They're in any any major application has them. Uh, for instance, friends recommendations on a, on a website like Facebook or uh, posts that you may like on on a website or on an application like Instagram. Uh, or let's say you're just finished reading a very interesting New York Times article about uh, a new program being created at MIT for AI, and then uh, it tells you the similar articles uh, to that one. So all of these are uh, what I'm calling data science products. You know, they're data products. They're products that affect the user experience using some sort of model and uh, combining data to train that model. Now, why, why would you ever want to do this? You know, why not just create something that does not have this? Why would I go to the work of doing this? And I think the short answer is that they work. They work really well. And if you have a problem that is well-defined, if you have a, a product that is well-defined, an engineering team that is solid, it works really well. And I will talk about this product later on. But in, in the example that I'm showing you here is uh, if you had the problem, when I worked at Forbes, we had a problem that we needed to, we published 110,000 articles a year. And we needed to decide which articles to push in your social media channels. Uh, and instead of uh, the traditional ways is to have humans to read all these articles and figure out when and what to post. So we created a bunch of models that will decide in, in collaboration with humans what is good to post and they outperform the previous efforts. So in short, they just work. Uh, data products increase wonderfully. Imagine if every, every editor in the New York Times had to select for each article which article to recommend. You know, this is a much, much better solution. Now, much more interesting than they, that they work for business practices, I think really what the provocation I want to leave you with is that data science products allow for a new class of user experience. I'm going to talk about this in a little bit, but you just think about it. Uh, I think this is really the kernel of it. It's not optimization things. This is it. You know, how can we have awesome user experiences with these products? Now, what the hell are they? I think they essentially have three components. There's a there's a data, there's a model, and there's a product. Uh, so. Uh, we're here talking about a software component or a system that collects and processes data regularly, that uses that data to train a model. That model can be something very, very simple, like a polynomial question, or it can be a neural network. Uh, and then that model, the output of that model, becomes a key component of a software product. You know, this sounds like gibberish, but the idea here is that you take data, train a model, and, and the output of that, that, you know, whatever that is, becomes, a, say, a component of your UI, how you present data to users and so forth. Now, before I go on, uh, I wanted to just to make a remark. I, I think you'll speak very quietly. Can you, can you hear 
well. Okay, good. Very nice. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about old and new ways of doing this. Um, and we'll get to the interesting stuff later on, but, you know, bear with me. Um, so uh, when I started my, my serious career, now my, you know, teenage career, uh, uh, you know, I, I worked for the United Nations. And it was a really amazing experience. I cherish those days a lot. Uh, now, I worked, when I started, I, I worked on a satellite imagery unit. And what we would do is, for instance, we'll look at, we'll, we'll say, we'll write some code to say, I want this satellite to take a picture of this area of the Earth right now. And I don't know if you know, but you can do that. And 45 minutes later, you have a picture of that area of the world. And that's amazing because you can do things like this. You know, this is not a picture we took. This is a public available image of oil fields in Iraq, you know, at the time they were being uh, burned in, with some sort of conflict. Um, so what I did is that I will take these things and I will use software, typically scripts, to analyze this, uh, this imagery uh, for creating certain insights. Uh, this is a recent analysis. I did do this analysis. But this is the kind of stuff that we will do in my team. Uh, we'll look, for instance, uh, in this case, look at number of constructions. And in this case, we're looking at the border between Syria and Jordan. And uh, you're trying to estimate the number of houses there. And if you look at this line at the very, at this chart at the very bottom here, uh, if you do that often enough, then you can kind of see a time series. And that's really cool. You know, that's kind of my, what my team is doing. Now, the problem with that, with that workflow of, of developing this data products is that it, it, it includes two steps, an investigation and documentation. So this is an academic workflow. You're trying to find out an insight and you write a paper about this or a presentation and you send this inside via email, and you hope that somebody does something about this. Uh, so I think this is, this is what I'm going to call the, the version one of how to design the systems, the system architecture, which is the, the, the way that most data products are built today. So if you go to a company like uh, the early days of Instagram, this is exactly how they did it. Or the early days of Facebook, this is exactly how they did it. A lot of people still do things this way on startups. And what is it in a, in a software development environment? This would be. A data scientist just builds a model on a local environment. The model, the model collects data from, let's say, some sort of database or local file system, or maybe queries an API. And then it ships them all over to software engineers uh, or an engineering team. And the engineering team has to figure out how, how the hell to implement that script or idea into the product that is user facing. Again, I cannot stress enough, this is the current way in which most teams operate. You have the data science team, and th they end their work and they ship the model over. Um, typically, the code work developed by data scientists is closer to research scripts. You know, they're kind of numbered scripts: zero underscore load data, one underscore preprocess, two underscore. You know, it's really what you would do if you were in academia, and that's fine if you wanted to, you know, publish a paper. In my case, I wanted to, you know, write a PDF file. But well, the problem is that that has lots of issues if you're in a product environment. If you have users, you have very slow iteration. So if you want to improve the model, you have to repeat the process. You have to rewrite the scripts. At times, they're not even source controlled. So you have to you know, rewrite them. And you know, maybe you forgot something. So it's terrible, terrible workflow. And then you have to ship it over once again to the engineering team. And they have to figure out what to do. Now two, uh, each user-facing feature needs custom implementations. Because when you ship it over, it's not that these models have some sort of standard that you know, an engineering team can just, you know, it's not a binary file, typically speaking. It's an idea. So they have to kind of completely re-implement it. And three, data science and engineering teams, which I think is the worst problem, there are odds. Data science and engineers just kind of hate each other. It's just terrible. Uh, and this is very common. When you join a company and you have a data science team, you will feel that tension. Uh, so it's, it's pretty tough. OK, let's move on from that. That's really terrible. Now, this is a lot more common, and I think there's a lot of innovation in this area. This is probably the scenario in which you're going to join if a company is serious, has a serious data science team. You have uh, the idea here is that the model is not the product anymore, but software is the product. So the model needs to be turned into software, and that becomes a product. And software has an interface, typically uh, an HTTP interface, so you can speak with other applications. And it goes as far as to be deployed. So in this case, the uh, data scientist team will build a model. 
in a, in a local environment, in an investigation environment, then uh, it will create a service in, you know, let's call this, you know, for, uh, uh, for conciseness, in a production environment. And that service, you know, internally is available to, let's say, the application, the main application that generates user-facing uh, experiences. Uh, let me put in a practical example. So let's assume that you have a backend in Ruby and uh, that generates a template and pushes it to the front end and, and React. Now the Ruby, uh, either the Ruby or the front end React will talk to the service API, uh, which is your model, and will render uh, UI experiences. So this is kind of what you see a lot today. Uh, the interfaces are typically HTTP, but some kind of more cutting edge people will try to do things in, let's say, some sort of uh, high performance protocol like ZeroMQ. Uh, have you ever heard of ZeroMQ? Whatever. I mean, it's just not HTTP. Uh, but you know, you, you have you heard of GraphQL? That's kind of the the hot uh, protocol these days. Um, so you would do it typically over HTTP. HTTP is the most common form to be used. Uh, you can use either REST or GraphQL. But you know the idea is very simple. Everyone can speak GraphQL. Everyone can speak REST. This service is deployed. And the engineer now does not have to figure out how the hell to implement this model. They just need to talk to it. And that just shortens things so much. OK. Now, if you are really in a really good team that uses this kind of architectures, then you will want to scale. So instead of having one address in which you speak, which is service, let's say one DNS, one subdomain, one IP address, you can create a service teaching API. So you can have, let's say, one subdomain. In my case, let's assume it will be models.glossier.com. Um, and then under that, I'll be able to query each one of the services or send data to each one of the services, and then this thing will magically combine the data and send it back to me. This is kind of more advanced things. You would see that if you're using GraphQL, uh, Apollo is really cool. That's kind of what it does among its many things. Uh, you can kind of have many GraphQL services and stitch them together, and now they're just all available in one single endpoint. Uh, there are many other configurations out there. You can use Ng uh, Nginx to create uh, paths in your subdomain. Anyway, there are many configurations here, but the idea is the same. Or uh, more interestingly, there is a lot of innovation in the machine learning world for people trying to tackle this exact problem. You know, how can I work with data scientists so that they can deploy the code into my system, and then I make this available with an HTTP interface to any application out there? Uh, one of these examples is Amazon SageMaker, but there are many, many others out there. So people are, this is kind of the area of innovation in this kind of data product space. A lot of people are trying to solve problems this way. Okay, I'll, I'll show you a real world example. This is kind of how, how we're doing things today at Glossier. Uh, I'll show you where we want to go, um, but I'll show you an example practically on how this works today. So, uh, I work at a company called Glossier, so we make uh, uh, we're uh, direct to customer e-commerce uh, in uh, company in the product sp in the beauty space. Uh, we sell beauty products today, but our mission is to really you know empower folks with uh, the idea of beauty. You know how can we rethink beauty and have conversations about it? Now in that mission, we want to launch a new app available in an app store near you uh, sometime in 2019. Now one of the problems that we have is that imagine that people make comments in this app. There are many, many problems here, but let's, let's focus on comments. Now, I am going to make a comment in an app about a product. And let's assume that this is the comment that I make. This is the only lit bomb I'm ever going to use for the rest of my life. Uh, the packaging is so easy, and all four cents, et cetera, are amazing. Get this with the solution, 30% discount now. You really want to treat yourself. OK, so from a natural language processing, this is a really tough problem. You know, the first highlighted element, this is a co-reference. You're, you're referencing something that is not even in the data that you have. So you have to have some sort of you know, global knowledge about what the hell is going on. You know, second, you're using really common words that are actually product descriptions or variants of the product being described. So in this case, cherry, rose, mint, and coconut. That's tough. So I can only know that this is a product variant because the sentence is about a product. And ultimately, there's another word called solution, which is the name of another product that is a common word. So this is a really tough problem. Um, and 
I, I think today the way of solving tough problems is to use neural networks. So yeah, fantastic. Okay, so I'll give you a little demo of how we're working on this today. Remember the architecture? You put it on a GraphQL uh, interface. Are you familiar with this? Are you seeing anything that you haven't seen before here? Is this good for everybody? Okay, so on the left-hand side, you have a query. We have a text. Imagine you write this in your app, and you, know, you write this text, and you write this thing. Your is great. Now, I read another sentence say, Ana Sui is, is a lot better. Okay, great. So it seems to work. I could give you, I mean, I'm being facetious here. I know these things work because I tested before, but there's a lot of things that don't work. Uh, uh, but, you know, the cool thing of using neural networks is that you understand a lot of context about the sentences. If you were to do, for instance, some sort of fancy rejects, you will, you know, you, you will get very far, but um, really on that, and this kind of problems in natural language processing, is, uh, it's a lot better to use neural networks. Uh, so if you change it for, you know, something is uppercase, uh, it will still catch it and so forth. Now, more, so how, how does this work in the context that I was telling you before? If you're so kind, uh, if you go, go go to this URL on your phones for two seconds. Oops, sorry. <laughs> so today, one of the biggest problems in, in when you're training neural networks is that you need a lot of data and you need a lot of annotated data, which essentially means you need a human to look at something and uh, tell if something's correct or wrong, and then use that annotated data to train a model, essentially saying, oh, look, these humans, which have superior intelligence abilities, thought that this was better, this is correct, and this is wrong. Now, I'll be frank with you, annotators are really expensive today, and I could really use a hand. So if you could annotate a few things for me, that would be really, really useful. So for instance, in this case, uh, the the model that I, you know, keep in mind the architecture that I described before. So the application here not only collects data, but it retrains itself. So um, I'm using this very handy tool called Prodigy, and I, it will load, hopefully, if it works on your phones. Uh, if it doesn't, I'm sorry, but I can show you an example here. So here, it doesn't really think that is a brand. You can see the score is very low, 0 0.03, but still wants you to tell you it's not a brand. And I can go on and on. And on and on. Oh, there you go. OK, I got the brand. OK, great, the brand for my example. So that looks correct. And you know, I save it, and it's saved. So now the model is a little better. So nightly, this will retrain itself, and it'll become better. So what we do when we design applications today, uh, using the architecture described earlier, is that, um, is that you don't only want applications to work as a service. They need to have the whole workflow inside of them. So it, here is not just the model, but you want all the three things that I talked earlier. You want the data collection system there, you want the model, and you want the application. So the, this application needs to be able to collect the data, retrain the model, and to serve its application. It, it cannot require a human. So in this case that I'm showing to you, I can go to a, an URL, train the application, and it will retrain itself. And the things that you've just added, the annotations you've added, will be available in an hour for this internal application that we're working on. Now, this is only one example. You could, of course, have a lot of other things. You could scrape data nightly. You could look at stock prices. But the idea here is that using this architecture, uh, the service must be able to do those three components, collect data, train a model, and serve it, serve the output. All right, cool. Now, uh, great. So let's look again at the issues that we had with the version one of this kind of architecture. So we, the iterations are really slow. So every time I, I had a new train model that was smarter, I would have to ship it over to the student engineering team. Um, User-facing uh, features needed custom implementations. Uh, and the data science and engineering teams were frequently at odds. Now, I think this kind of architecture solves all of these problems because the Interface does not change for the engineering teams querying that interface. It would just become better. The, res the results would be better. 
uh, iterations will be a lot faster because, in fact, this model is retrained every hour. So you can call that an iteration. Uh, that's fantastic. I don't, you know, the engineers have to do nothing. And finally, uh, you don't need a custom implementation. Well, at least not you know, as much as before. You still need to do something with data, but that's a lot less work. Now, there is also a lot of issues with this kind of architecture. Um, I think the most pressing issue here are issues that you're not going to have, but a lot of data scientists have. They just don't have the skills to develop a product. I mean, but really, you're asking somebody not only to learn neural networks, but to be able to fully deploy them as a web service. I mean, it's kind of a big ask. Not only to do that, but if you're doing that, you need to develop with good software development practices, you know, hopefully fully task driven, you know, or even better yet, high performance so that it can withstand, you know, have a response time with less than 100 milliseconds. And, you know, really, this is a tough ask. So what you're going to see today in the world of, of you know, companies is that you're going to join, if they're using this kind of architecture, the data science teams are not really data science teams. They're, you know, kind of data products teams. And what those teams are is that they have data scientists, which are folks that have, let's say, PhD and statistics and machine learning. And then they collaborate with software engineers, and they're typically called dot engineers. And together, they develop the system. So but this, this kind of, are kind of hybrids. Hybrids. Um, OK. Now, the other issue with this is that you're putting a lot of responsibility in the data, team, in the data science teams. So let's assume that your algorithm is now less performance or not interesting. So now uh, th that team has to respond for it. And you know, that, this might be a, a big issue. Because now you have a user-facing feature that is uh, managed by kind of a team. OK, so this is, I think, the most interesting part uh, of what we would like to go, uh, not only at Glossier, but I think in the industry at large. Now, here the idea is that the, the system is the product. So you don't, you know, you don't need this kind of implementation thing. You can create maybe a protocol that manages user interactions. And this protocol has things like, oh, these are UI things that appear when a user does things, or chat messages, or a set uh, of user interactions. And then a, a series of models will just send data to those things. And they will appear to the user depending on user preferences and depending on any other business metric. So how does this system work? This system, uh, you first need to create a, a protocol that translates model objects to user experiences. So these are typically, let's say, if you have a website it, and the model says, give the user a discount, then a pop-up will appear. You know, think of it that way. Now, the second essential component is that you need to create a system that turns models into services. So all that work that the full stack developer needs to do, now you need to simplify it. How can you just send a script, and that script will be turned into a service? By service, let's say a Docker container that has an HTTP interface. Uh, and finally, you need to create a process for automatically evaluating if these products actually work, if this stuff works in production, if each one of these models are actually working. Now, we thought, why don't we create a system that writes articles in combination with writers, that helps writers write better articles, learns the writing styles or topics, their their structural composition of these articles. And together, they can write better articles. You know, we can measure the output of each one of these things, and together, we can write better articles. And this is how we came with the idea of Birdie. Uh, this is a, so this is all public information. You can read about it elsewhere. Uh, so really, uh, really interesting. OK, so I want to show you, remember the architecture in which the service talks directly to the user, changes the user experience. Now, you continue to write the article, and the article does not have an image. And I am writing about this Broadway play that a model did. So another model will show up here, and it will insert this UI element, say, oh, maybe you just kind of want to add an image. I figure out that maybe you want to add this image from our own image provider so that we don't have uh, licensing issues. And we'll add it to your, to your article. And you're already with the, with the right caption. Um, now, you save that, that, you're ready to publish, and there's some metadata elements. And this is something that most writers hate to do. I need to write an excerpt of the article. So instead of writing it manually, why don't I have it write for me? So there's a completely different model that will go there and write the article for you. In this case, they did a really good job. Sometimes they did a terrible job. And you will write a draft for you using your own style of writing. So you will have learned how you write. I mean, the draft will be very crude, 
but it will contain the essential elements to break the white, you know, the blank space, so you can kind of get going on starting your article. Of course, um, if you dislike the stuff, so this is the actual system architecture. If you dislike the story, you, keep, you could keep saying, please stop this nonsense. And uh, you will learn that you just really dislike it and you will stop recommending things. At first, if you just dislike one kind of nonsense, you will stop saying that kind of nonsense. But if you really dislike it systematically, it will stop completely. I mean, if you really, really dislike it, you can just turn it off entirely. But you know, you get the idea. Uh, you will learn which things you like more than others. As soon as you open uh, your login to the system, you open a WebSocket connection with, uh, well, you load the components and you keep sending data back to the server. And that's your regular editor. Now, you also open a WebSocket connection with the Birdie AI server. This is what you called it. Uh, and within that WebSocket connection, you had a back and forth conversation. That conversation could be explicit. You could actually ask Birdie AI things. But he would also record every keystroke that he did. So he will record everything, and all that will be sent back to Birdie AI. And occasionally, one of the models would say, well, you know, it seems that every time you write things this way, every time you write things this way, you may want this. So one of the models may have an opinion. And that opinion would go back to this thing we call the propensity neuron, which will figure out how likely it would be that A, you would like that opinion, and B, it will have an impact on your article. And those two things combined will determine if there will be a UI representation or not. And maybe the case you dislike that stuff, but we really, really want you to change it. Let's say you use a, a curse word in your title, and you're like, you know, please change it. Uh, even if you really disliked it, it, sometimes it will still appear. But you know, you, you, get, you get the gist. Um, so what is cool about this kind of architecture is that uh, I think one cool note about this is that this this models this system is built for each model to be super fast. By fast, I mean response time with less than 100 milliseconds uh, on, on each response. It takes uh, 10,000 uh, queries a minute. They just develop the model, and then it goes all the way until creating user-facing experiences. And if it works, if it's a really good thing, it will remain alive. If it is a really bad thing, it will die. Uh, so, you know, the data scientists kind of just have to be worried about creating new models and more models and so forth. So that's great. We crossed that with V3. Now, we still have the last remaining issue, which is a lot of responsibility. And quite frankly, that's a really cool problem to have. So we're going to keep that one there. That's it. <laughs>
uh, a model and the building of the model largely means creating uh, an architecture for that model and the architecture is software, you know, you write it in, in software. So I think neural networks are really cool for that. A lot of the tools around it have been designed by computer engineers, for computer engineers, uh, so that's very welcoming. You can get a trained model that detects objects and immediately add that model to your application and creating interfaces around it. And I think that's just really cool. So I would, I would definitely, if you want to experiment with it, I'll start with neural networks, maybe object detection, maybe natural language processing, and have fun with it. I think uh, the one piece of advice that I think is super important for somebody in this position or software engineer at large is build a product. Build a product that solves a problem for you. Small product, doesn't have to be big. But that really solves that problem and ideally that has users. Those users can be your friends and family. But look, that says it all because that will give you not just the understanding of what the software minutiae are, but it will give you an understanding of, of, of what you are, what software is in, in, in the context that you, that you exist in. And I think that's, that will get you to another level. If you're, if you're always inside the code editor, you can only go so far. If you're outside the code editor and see the finished product that the user sees, I think that's when you made it, to be honest. Uh, that person comes across, if I were to interview people, as clearly superior. Than, uh, than a person that has only lived inside a code editor. You know, um, I, I love, look, I'm really impressed. And I said this not to, to humor you. I am really impressed. Uh, I think that, and you know, I've been to this boot camps before, especially in New York City where we have a lot of them. I, the energy here is very good. It makes me want to be here. Uh, really, it makes me want to be here sharing the space, uh, answering questions, solving problems together with people. It's really, really good energy. And I think that alone gets people really far. Uh, that's really hard to build. You know, and as I was telling you before, you know, the, the first thing is as soon as the talk's over, instead of people running to the viewers, they rent to their computers uh, to finish their assignments. So that's, that's really cool. You know, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, I'm looking forward to see what these people do. And I think the culture that it exists here, that you create here, are gonna get are gonna be key to making these folks succeed.